lecture 28 of ECE 503. So in this lecture, we're going to cover the all-important topic, uh, more of an application of digital signal processing called filter banks. So filter banks is, as you're probably finding out in your course project, and uh, in a lot of places that you don't realize happen or use filter banks, filter banks is a way of dividing and conquering a signal, right? So just like what we saw before with, like, let's say, multi-stage um, uh, sam uh, sampling rate conversions, right? Like a series of down converters or a series of up converters and the like. What filter banks does is essentially it divides up some sort of signal into a collection of its individual components and then processes them and then uh, returns it back to its original form. Or not. Okay? So for instance, there's things called subband coders, right? Uh, they can be used in things like audio processing and similar, where let's say you want to take speech, um, decompose it into its basic forms, um, uh, translate it into a binary representation, send it over the air, or save it into an MP3, and then afterwards reconstitute it into the original sound file. You can also, filter banks are found in what wireless technology? Wi-Fi. And actually, it's also used, uh, yeah, it actually is used in 4G, LTE, and LTA. So this is something I'm more familiar with. Um, what happens is there's a technology called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, or OFDM. That is a very, very computationally efficient form of filter banks. So filter banks has this beautiful property of well, there, it, it, there are two, let, let, we can look at it either as the glass half full or half empty. So I'll show you. Actually, no, that sounds negative. There are two ways to look at filter banks. So if you take a signal, okay, and you decompose it. So the way you decompose a signal, that sounds also very negative. So let's say I take this signal, and then let's say I have f1 of n, f2 of n, f3 of n, f4 of n, all the way to fm of n. Okay, And let's say each one of those filters takes one m of the spectrum, then you downsample by M. Okay. You can do some really cool things with this, right? So what happens is now you've decomposed this process, decomposed this signal, X of N, into M frequency components. And then you can do whatever sort of processing you want at this end. Do you want to, let's say, encode each one of the outputs here into a set of code words or like, you know, from a code book and make a binary representation and make an MP3 or some sort of audio file, digital audio file or digital representation? Um, or let's say you want to treat the signal. Let's say some of these frequencies you want to filter out or amplify more and others you want to, like let's say each one of these frequencies you want to treat differently. So then, so let's say at this end you do treatment, okay? A loose term, but essentially you can handle each frequency bin, okay? Or channel um, using a signal processing technique. At this end, this end, each one of these guys. What do we call the process? of taking a signal and decomposing it this way for that sort of treatment. We analyze it, right? Analyze. I'm going to analyze that guy <laughs> over there. I'm looking at a guy looking at his phone. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, but what happens is we call this, <laughs> we call this, an analysis filter bank, or FB. Because the process of decomposing a signal and breaking up into these M distinct components to be treated later or to be studied later, we call it analysis, right? 
Now, what's kind of interesting is we can also take, let's say, a bunch of composite signals. Let's say we take these individual signals. We upsample them by M. We filter them. Essentially, what we're doing is we're taking one of the periodic replicas from the upsampling stage. So let's say G1 of N upsample. G2 of N upsample. G3 of N upsample. G4 of N all the way down to upsample GM of N. And then what we do is we sum these guys together. I'm going to put one humongous sum. Woo! And then produce an output X of N. So we see this a lot as well. So what happens when we do something like that? We build a signal from these, dis these, these separate uh, sources and such, these different components. What, what do we call that? Synthesize, exactly. So we synthesize. So this guy is called a synthesis filter bank, or FB. So those are the basic components of a filter bank system. Um, now it's kind of interesting. You can employ this in one of several ways. What you can do, okay, I have to discard my beautiful diagram. You can employ it one of two ways, and it's really interesting. So communication systems, like OFDM, okay, so OFDM, and I'll just put in brackets what that stands for, orthogonal, frequency, division, multiplexing. So that's an example, e.g. But in general, in comms, in communications, we have the following, the following setup. We have synthesis filter, right? Or syn synthesis filter bank. We then transmit over the air, if this is a wireless, so you can also do it over like cable modem or whatever. You go through the channel. You have a receive antenna. And then you have an analysis filter, right? A filter bank. So that's one configuration, right? There's a name for this, OK? So if you look in the literature, especially around the 1990s, early 2000s, so we this is the synthesis filter bank. This is the analysis filter bank. The way comm systems use this is, let's say you have a message of one user here, or the same user, but one part of the binary message. You have another part of the message here, another part of the message here, another part of the message, another part of the message. You pass it through this entire process, so they're treated individually, okay? And then they're combined. And the way they're combined, the, the synthesis filters, they're chosen so, such that I, each band does not overlap with each other. There's, they're always complementary to each other. So it's almost like having M, narrow band transmission, side by side by side by side, transmitted over the air. They're summed together, transmitted over the air. And the analysis filter bank, it picks them all apart and processes them individually. Okay? So that's how OFDM works. Why? Because sometimes in the wireless environment or even in the wired environment, some frequencies will be more affected than others. So what happens is you may want to invest more energy, more resources on those channels, and we call these subcarriers, more energy to recover the signal there than from other let's say, subcarriers that are not as badly affected. So that follows a divide and conquer 
paradigm. And the name that this, is, this structure has been referred to since the 1990s and early 2000s, they might still say this, is something called a transmultiplexer. Because what happens is usually a structure like this has a single high-speed information source and then you've got a demultiplexer putting information in each one of these subcarriers. Then at the receiver end, you have a MUX. So that's a DMUX. And then you have a MUX here combining everything to create the, the high speed signal at the other end. Okay? Now, um, so this, this is used in comps a lot. On the other hand, in areas like, signal, uh, like speech signal processing and the like, you have the exact opposite. So let's say you have sound file, so speech signal processing. And what happens is you decompose it into different frequency bins. Sounds familiar? use your analysis filter banks to, to pick apart it, th that signal, right? So low frequency, medium frequency, high frequency. You treat the individual components, maybe you quantize them with a VQ, and then you, uh, and then you convert it into a code word, and you send it over a channel, let's say, or medium, or whatever. And then at the other end, so let's say here's your, your environment, uh, your database, your computer network, and then what happens is, if you want to reconstruct it, you use your synthesis filter bank. So you have these guys. Okay? Some. And so the arrangement is you have analysis filter bank first, you have your, uh, your, you know, your transmission environment, okay? And then you have your synthesis filter to, to basically reconstruct your audio or speech signal, right? And this guy is called a subband coder, okay? So, the nice thing about filter banks is that you can use them in an either or configuration. You can either use synthesis then analysis filter banks or the other way around. So it's a wonderful configuration. All right. All right. So in general, like so I, I drew this in the slides as well. So you have synthesis, you have analysis filter banks. Um, and they're kind of denoted like this, but we've seen other structures like this as well, right? We've seen where you can cascade. You can actually take from lecture 27, that sort of like that sampling rate conversion business, and you can have sort of a tree structure where you can take high pass and low pass contributions, split those up, then split those contributions up progressively and form a filter bank that way, which is very simple and divide by conquer approach, okay? But in general, so the, here's sort of a reminder. So subband coders, you have an analysis, then a synthesis filter bank. Transmultiplexers is the exact opposite. Wavelets is kind of an interesting thing too. So wavelets, what they do is you have um, essentially your analysis and filter, uh, a synthesis filters progressively get narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. So it's kind of what you're doing for your course project where you have these cascade of high pass, low pass combinations and such. Now imagine if you just get rid of the low pass contribution. So let's say you have high pass and low pass. Then you just focus on the high pass contribution and do high pass, low pass, but you keep low pass the same. Oh, then you take the high pass of that and do high pass, low pass. Oh, and then you just take the high pass of that and do high pass, low pass. So let's, I might be getting the order incorrect, but the concept is about, about that. So suppose you have this. So like in our course project, you take this guy, high pass, low pass filter, 
right? And then downsample by two. So let's look at analysis filter, synthesis should be identical. Now, let's take this guy. High pass filter, low pass filter, down sample by two, down sample by two. High pass filter, low pass filter, down sample by two, down sample by two. And you can keep on going and going. So spectrally, how does this look like? It will look like this. So the low path, so you will have this big swath. So let's say this is zero to pi. Then the next guy is from pi over two to boop, 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 boop. three pi over four. Yeah, that's right. And then the last guy is cut in half. So that guy will be What? Yes, that's right. If you ever do woodworking with me, I need somebody with that sort of mathematical skills. <laughs> it's like, how much should I cut this wood by? You know. What? That's true. But it will take longer to do. <laughs> so what happens is, what ends up happening is, this might be very useful then afterwards, like suppose for speech, for instance. Most of your information, like you might want to do the inverse. So let's say you might want to do this in a case where most of your interesting information, let's say it's not speech, but most of your interesting information is located here and you want more resolution and put a lot more resources into these narrow bands and get better resolution. And here might be a very sparse amount of information, so you don't want to deal with it too much. All right? So that's kind of the concept behind a wavelet, is, is just this progressively smaller and smaller band. And this is just an example where you have, you know, you just constantly split by half by half by half by half by half. You also have a few other kind of cool design techniques. So you have something here called um, uh, a, a prototype low-pass filter-based designs. So this is kind of a trick that, it, like, let's say we go back to this guy here. It is possible with one filter, all you need to do is you need one low pass filter and then modulate it to a new, like let's say each one of these guys. Let's say that's the low pass, band pass, band pass, band pass, band pass, all the way to high pass. What do you do? You just take the low pass and modulate it to a new center frequency every time. So we call that a prototype low pass filter approach. Um, it has some pros, but it also has some cons. Uh, especially when it comes to, let's say you have two low-pass filters next to each other that have been modulated to adjacent pass bands. Um, how much overlap can the two tolerate before they start interfering with each other? That's an issue. There's also something called, and this is fun. This is a lot of DSP fun involved in this. There's something called perfect reconstruction filter banks. So what perfect reconstruction filter banks do, suppose you design each one of those synthesis and analysis filters, let's say by a low-pass prototype approach, let's say you custom build it each one yourself. What happens is suppose you take a signal, decompose it into its respective subcomponents, and then reconstitute it. Perfect reconstruction means that you get the perfect original signal back from its decomposed components. That's what perfect reconstruction is. It's kind of challenging to do because what you want to do is you want to design your filter banks such that you do not have any residual interference or distortion once you bring those signals back together. All right? There's also multi-carrier modulation. That specifically deals with things like cable modems and Wi-Fi and such. There's something called DFT, discrete Fourier transform filter banks, which is based off of a DFT structure, and there are a variety of others. So Filter banks, they're everywhere, right? So if you're ever interested in knowing more about filter banks, okay? So your book, 
your textbook does an okay job. Um, of course, this is being recorded and put on the web eventually. So, um, you know, but I mean, it does a good attempt. But if you really want some great references on filter banks, I mean, only filter banks, everyone should be screaming, yeah. What happens is there are two great books. The one is by uh, P.P. Vaginathan. So it's called Multi-Rate Systems and Filter Banks. It's from um, around 1991, 92. I, I can't see the risk. I think it's 92. And it's by Prentice Hall. This book like, is always on my Christmas wish list. I just somehow Santa never gives this to me. I don't know why. Maybe I just don't give enough hints at home. Hmm, there's this book. I really like to have it one day and stuff. Never get it. But it's awesome. It starts from the very fundamentals of multi-rate signal processing and filter bank theory, and then it teaches, it basically covers everything. So the professor, uh, I'm trying to think, where is Vaginathan at? I would have to think. I think he's either Santa Barbara or USC. I'm suspecting Santa Barbara because they have a very good signal processing group there. The other book that's also great is by Fliege, uh, NJ Fl uh, Norbert Fliege. So uh, multi-rate digital signal processing, multi-rate systems, filter bank, and wavelets. Also a great book. I think our library has both of them. So if you really want to do research into filter banks or you want to do anything with filter banks, filter banks, these are great books, all right? There's other readings as well. So, um, so there, there, was, there was a guy who had the same PhD advisor as me at McGill, and uh, he did everything, or did a good job, I thought, um, on, uh, in particular, transmultiplexers. What he focused on in particular is, I think he took basically a combination of the REMES filter design algorithm and tried to create prototype filters based on REMES that met perfect reconstruction criteria, which was insane. It, like, uh, but, but he produced a really good PhD thesis. It's from 1990. It's at McGill. I think it's online, so you can just search for it. Uh, so R.P. Ramachandran. So he's actually um, on faculty right now. What is the name of the University of New Jersey? Rowan University. Rowan? Where is that? It's in southern New Jersey. Okay? But he's on faculty there. Really nice guy. I think his father is also a professor as well, so um, at Concordia University in Montreal. My thesis, I touch upon, I'm, I applied more to wireless communications um, and resource allocation, but I have my, my chapter two, my introductory chapter, or my background chapter, is a huge tutorial on all things filter banks, so you'll love it, especially when it comes to MIMO. Um, if you don't have a lot of time, and you just want to look at journal papers. So Anna Scaglioni, um, Giorgio Giannakis, and Sergio Barbarossa, they have a two-part uh, journal paper, um, um, two-part journal paper articles uh, on like how filter banks describe everything, anything complex. So that was actually pretty cool. So you should definitely check that out if you're interested. And lastly, and and this I thought was a really nice read. So Scaglioni and Giannakis and Barbarossa. Uh, they go into a lot of nitty-gritty after a while, and then they go into spread spectrum and, and a lot of math. If you want something like um, quantitative but a little bit uh, bigger picture or higher, like, you know, before going into a lot of details, so Akansu, uh, DuML, Lin, and Du Courville, uh, they also had a great tutorial-like paper as well in IEEE uh, transaction signal processing. Okay. So, um, in fact, what I would recommend that you all do if you want to appreciate fi filter banks a lot, is check out Scaglioni and Al, as well as Akansu and Al's papers. So Akansu should be um, a decent read. Um, a lot more attention and detail would be in Scaglioni's paper. All right? So let's, let's look at a couple of examples. So here's the subband coder. So, uh, so here is the exact opposite of what I'd just drawn before. So here, what I did is I flipped around high-pass and low-pass contributions. So in this case, this would make a much better speech coder. So assume, let's say, that I put the same amount of resources into every band at the output. Do I care about high-frequency bands? Mm, somewhat, but not a lot. I care a lot about the low frequencies because that's where a lot of the information is located. So what I would want to do is 
carve up the low frequency components progressively smaller and smaller and smaller, and then spend the same amount of time on a very narrow low, low pass portion or lower frequency component and not spend too much time or too much resources other than I have to on a wide chunk of the high frequency, um, uh, high frequency components. And so we have a subband encoder and a subband decoder, as shown here. There's something called uniform frequency banks. So, um, uh, uh, sorry, uniform frequ um, filter banks. That's what you guys are doing for your course project, right? So your course project, just from a frequency standpoint, does exactly that. And it's also crafty. I wonder who came up with that course project description. I don't know. I heard he's smart. Oh, really? Uh, no, just kidding. <clears throat> Sorry. I'll tell my other personalities to be quiet. So. so what happens is, in your project, you have high pass filter, low pass filter, down sample by two. So what you've got is, let's say your frequency looks like this, right? And then you take the high pass component and the low pass component and down sample by two. What do you get? So the filter will basically act on that and then it will down sample by two so it's going to spread out. So what you're going to get is after that you're going to get a house looking structure down here right from minus pi to pi minus pi to pi what is the high pass component going to look like is it going to look like this or is it going to look like this right so what happens is is that it's going to spread out and uh, it's to go from minus pi to pi. Then you notice we do this again. We now take the high pass version and the low pass version, okay, component, and down sample by two and do the exact same thing again. And then the same thing here. So what we're ultimately doing is we're carving up the signal, carving up the signal, carving up the signal, just using some very basic high pass and low pass filters. And then downsample. So the downsampling spreads the signal across the entire minus pi to pi frequency range. And then, so what happens is what we're doing is very simply, we're decomposing ultimately what this guy's accomplishing. Okay, so this is equivalent to this is equivalent to the following. It is equivalent to me taking that signal, right? Let's say that's minus pi, that's pi. So let's say, because it's redundant, this half, let's focus on one half. And what I'm doing is I'm filtering this portion, this portion, this portion, and this portion. What I'm doing is I'm filtering out those four guys uniformly, right? This is the same bandwidth as this, same bandwidth as that, same bandwidth as this, right? And then... Um, so I have one-fourth of the spectrum, I downsample by four, right? So I take this guy, downsample by four, downsample by four, downsample by four, downsample by four, such that it spreads across from minus pi to pi, and then I can do my analyses on it, all right? So we call this, whenever we have uniform bandwidth, the same bandwidth, we call it a uniform filter bank. Right? So what your system is doing is you're basically filtering and progressively uh, decomposing your signal until you have uniform segments. Right? But the only difference is a uniform filter bank does it in one stage. And it has M filters 
all of them cutting out the same bandwidth of frequency, but at different frequency locations. All right? All right. So one thing, and Vaginathan's book does a great job with this, is the polyphase realization of uniform filter banks. So what you can do, because notice that your uniform filter bank, um, what it what will do, like let's, let's say we take the structure. What does a uniform filter bank do? So let's say you have a uniform filter bank. So first of all, let's say it's based on a prototype low pass filter, right? So first of all, I'll make that assumption. And it's a uniform filter bank. So what it will do is, let's say we look at analysis only. Suppose you have four. You have F1 of n, F2 of n, F3 of n, F4 of n. And then you downsample by, f by 4. OK? So what we've got is we have this. And we ask ourselves, is there a better way? Because notice, we have, this, we have these analysis filters. And then we have this bank of down samplers. We're throwing away one fourth of the sample from each one of these guys. Can we simplify things? Can we? So the question is, can we use the polyphase representation to obtain a more efficient implementation? And so why do I ask that? Because notice, like let's say I have 300 coefficients for this guy. Oh, and I have 300 coefficients for this guy. And 300 coefficients and so on and so forth. I'm wasting coefficients. I'm wasting hardware resources. And then I'm throwing away one fourth of that, right? Can I do this better? You know, and still preserve this beautiful uniformity? And the answer is absolutely. So what you would do, is the following. What you would do is essentially you would take the analysis filter bank and instead suppose you you actually design these polyphase filters, n of them, right? And they're based, essentially you have this single filter and what you're doing instead is you're doing the same sort of subsampling we did when we were talking about polyphase uh, representations, right? And the decimation now what we've got is we have this P0 of M, P1 of M, P2 of M, and we apply the noble identity to put the decimation on the other side. And where does the decimation go? Commutator, right? So what we do is, instead of having our analysis filters and then downsample, here's the trick. So instead of sending our data all at once to all the branches, and then we have, and then we have, um, let's say, the analysis filters, each at a different frequency, and then we downsample. What we do instead is we only, we, we only feed a subset of data to each channel, to each subchannel. So we're, down, we're downsampling anyway with a delay element, I might add. And then what happens is, because we have that, we need to transform those analysis filters into their polyphase representations. So in fact, what I can do is I can take that one single uh, filter, the H0, the prototype filter, okay, in this case, and I could essentially now uh, uh, subsample that in order to get the um, you know, polyphase representation. So like the, you might ask, how does a commutator um, downsample? And, and, and other than me using my hand, let me show you. So here's an example of how a commutator works. Because a commutator does not work 
like instantaneously. It takes time like everything else. So let's say I have, suppose I have this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, okay? So what happens is this thing is swinging in finite time. So let's say I dump one, and now I go over here. I dump two. But what happens is one's on hold. So in fact, what happens is the data, uh, each sample, here might be some period t, right? Like, so let's say, oh, sorry, big t. And two will be t long. And three, the value of t will be, uh, will be t long, and so on and so forth. Now, one is dropped off, and it waits. 4t long until the next sample, which is going to be 5. Right? And then it's going to be 9. So what happens is this is where we're getting our downsampling, right? And then likewise, on channel 2, we're going to have the value 2. And it's going to last 4t as long. And then 6, 4t as long. And then 10, 4t as long. Then 3, then 4, and 7, and 8, and 11, and 12. So what we're doing essentially is we're stretching out the duration of that each sample by a factor of 4. We're essentially downsampling, right? And then what ends up happening? So the downsampling is taken care of. So now we need to choose an appropriate analysis filter, and that's where the polyphase comes in, so we need the noble identities, in order to process that downsampled data. Because the original analysis filter bank, we have the analysis filter, analysis filter, and then we have downsampler, right, by n. Now what I want to do is move this to the other side, and that's accomplished by the commutator. So this thing, in case you don't know what it's called, is called a commutator, right? And then we do the filtering. Therefore, just like before, remember we have the polyphase, so it's like P naught Z to the fourth, and then if you use the noble identity, the fourth disappears. We have to do that manipulation here. All right? So that's how, like in this case, the polyphase filters, what we do is we, we first of all, instead of having all the data stream in at the same time to all branches, we commutate it. We already downsample it. And then we use the polyphase filters of the analysis filters in order to get the data. All right? So computationally more efficient. My polyphase filters are, in this case, one-fourth as large, and I don't waste samples. And I make good on a commutator that also saves on the complexity of feeding data any which way. All right. So that's really powerful stuff. OK, and that also concludes Lecture 28. All right. So what we saw...